Hey guys. Well, happy Tuesday <laughs> and happy new year. Is it, is it too late to say happy new year? Maybe. <laughs> so I am so happy to have Dayanis Chang with us today from awning.com. Dayanis, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Super excited. Well, we're excited to have you here. So when we have anyone on the show, I really love to just start at the very beginning and ask how you got into real estate investing, <laughs> because most of us have some you know, pretty scary stories about you know, first starting out and all the mistakes we made and all the money we lost or you know, whatever. Um, and then you know, the journey along the way is, uh, is, is always a fascinating story to hear. So let's jump right in and you know, audience members, you know, as you guys join us, uh, fire questions at us. It's, it's a live broadcast, it's raw, it's uncensored. So you know, don't be shy to fire questions at us. On that note, uh, Danis, yeah, tell us about your first investment property and how you got into real estate investing. Yeah, so um, let's go back to my heritage and my background. Um, I'm actually talking to you from Dallas Fort Worth. Um, okay. I moved here during COVID because this is where we actually grew up and this is where my family's based. And um, my parents immigrated from, that were Chinese heritage, immigrated okay. from Taiwan to. Um, to Fort Worth, Texas. A lot of people are like, how did they end up there? My dad ended up <laughs> getting a scholarship to TCU, which uh, okay. lost, <laughs> but uh, made it pretty far in the, in the, uh, in the championships uh, just yesterday. <laughs> but um, basically, uh, they immigrated here. They um, had very humble beginnings. My dad was a teacher. My mom worked in a factory and in the daycare, and they saved up a lot of money. And with that money being saved and, and you know, I'm being a little bit um, nice about it. They were really, really cheap. <laughs> and they saved up. <laughs> it's a fine saved, line between frugal and cheap. Frugal and cheap. I think, I think they were pretty cheap. And that's kind of the ongoing <laughs> joke. But I can say it. Um, so they, they saved up as much money as they, can, they could. And they had the big American dream of buying their first house. So they bought a first house. And, in, in, you know, Fort Worth isn't a tiny town, but it's not massive either. Let's let's rewind all the way back to the 70s, but they basically purchased the house, I think, for like $30,000. And, um, you know, uh, my, my siblings were born. I was born. Um, they saw another house come on the market, I think, a couple of years later um, on the same street. It was a little bit better. They decided they wanted to purchase that house. But rather than selling that last house, they ended up renting it out. And um, long story short, uh, this became something that they kind of hacked and, and, um, and repeated over and over again. And so I grew up around all of that when I was, I don't know, I was young as like 10 or something like that. I remember visiting um, our, these rental properties with my parents and actually like fixing toilets. Actually, I was probably just playing around, but I, I, I ended up learning and um, started to you know, work on fences, fix toilets, all that good stuff. So it was just part of my DNA. Um, ended up uh, going to University of Texas, graduated with a degree in finance, and um, started going in that entire path, working uh, in technology and a few other areas. But um, what the big thing my parents ended up pushing towards me was, you know, go get your first house, but get it as early as possible. And right when I graduated, I ended up working for Deloitte Consulting. And I remember getting so excited because they gave me a, um, a signing bonus. And with that signing bonus, um, the big intention was I'm going to use that to go purchase my first house. So I was like, I don't know, 21, 22. Um, I'm all looking for a great house uh, in Austin. And that's, that's where I went to school and that's where I started working. And I put my first uh, down payment um uh for a really humble um kind of house kind of in the, in the outer skirts of austin but still within austin and um i realized oh that's not enough money for a down payment i had to go get <laughs> you know my parents to help out a little bit on that side um but we purchased a um i purchased a four bedroom two and a half bath house in austin and um i, I don't know if everyone listening has heard the term house hack but basically, there's lots of different ways to, to hack a house. Um, but what I ended up doing was, um, in this case, I purchased the house. And then I recruited three of my best friends to go be my roommates. And we were trying to figure I've out what that something myself. that's really fair I love for it. them. Yeah, you've done that, right. Um, trying to figure out what would be you know, really um, fair for them, but fun for me and, and 
beneficial to me. And um, basically, I took all my payments, the, the mortgage, the escrow, you know, taxes, that, that, those types of details, and divided amongst three people. And that's how I came up with the rent. So they basically paid my mortgage and my taxes, but I put down the down payment and, and such. And that's how I got into um, owning my first uh, property. Um, that it's I a great way to get into the game. Out. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. So from there, how did you scale up your real estate portfolio? What what changed for you? Because I mean, obviously there are there there's a speed limit on how many properties you can house hack, right? So you know that's something you can do, you know, for a couple properties, but you can't build a a big real estate portfolio by house hacking. So how did you scale, and how did your strategy change over time? So I, I was living in Austin. I'd lived there for a few years, living in this house that was, you know, kind of like this frat house of, of people. And um, at some point, I started focusing a little more on my career. I started working for a home builder called Pulte and um, did a little bit of work for them. And then ultimately ended up getting recruited to work for Lennar, which is another large home builder based in the Bay Area. And um, I basically was like, okay, I'm going to go get paid, you know, twice as much and, and make a lot of money and moving to um, the Bay Area. But then I realized, whoa, well, houses were like literally three to four times as much. Um, Crazy expensive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I, I was kind of bummed out that I didn't feel like I could afford a house to go, you know, buy and then go do this house hack thing. Um, I ended up renting a place, but I still was making, you know, money and saving. So I decided to actually go buy another investment property. And I didn't know the Bay Area well enough, but I knew Austin pretty well. So um, I looked for another property there, uh, not too far from the, the property that I, I currently owned. Um, I found a renter for that property, found this other property that wasn't too far and purchased that. Um, the specs are almost exact, four bedrooms, <laughs> two and a half bath, a few blocks from each other. Um, but I knew I could go rent that thing out. So I ended up uh, taking an investment loan, I believe, at that time. So it was maybe an extra percent um, point on top of that. But I I saw that um, I could at least, you know, break even or cash flow positive a little bit. And it just seemed like a no brainer to me. Yeah. I mean, Austin, as you know, has become a very expensive uh, housing market. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure when you were buying there, but it was probably still somewhat expensive then, uh, but still easier to find cash flowing properties in Austin than in the Bay Area, where it's almost impossible to find rental properties that cash flow positively. Uh, it's, it's <laughs> talking about a brutal yeah, market. And, and, and I'll date myself a little bit here. I was buying kind of in the uh, mid 2000s. Um, or okay. So, so a little more affordable. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely a, a little more affordable. Um, and I'm, and you know, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, sort of that journey. But I would say, you know, buying that second property as a pure investment property, that's what actually sealed it to say, you know, what I am a real estate investor versus this accidental, you know, landlord right. or accidental real estate investor. And, you know, just kind of thinking about the fact that I wanted to build a portfolio similar to my parents, but also at the same time, I couldn't afford to buy in one area, but I still wanted to own something. Um, just made me feel a little bit better. But, you know, as a whole, buying an investment property with intention, that's when I started really feeling like I was a real estate investor. So from there, uh, did you continue buying properties in Austin? What, what how, how did you grow your portfolio and what, how, how big did you eventually grow your portfolio to? Yeah. So I'm, I'm close to about 20 total units all in, um, my parents, uh, you know, they're, they're older, moved back to Fort Worth to be a little bit closer with them. Um, they've, they've kind of grown their, their, uh, count to, you know, around 30 or over or so. So we're That's kind great. of working together um, with our own little family portfolio, but um, I love it. yeah. So <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, the, the I think you know the question about you know how did I start to move into some of these other properties? You know, after I bought that second property, um, actually let's let's go back to some interesting times, and I think it's really interesting for for people to understand. 
um, you know, this, this market that's correcting right now. And then looking back and saying, when's the last time that happened? And, uh, you know, the investors out there have probably heard about 2007 to 2008, then 2009, which was this kind of like crazy wild real estate curve. Um, it's a tough you know, time to live through as a real estate investor. Oh yeah. It was, it was I got, crazy, I got pretty but... badly burned. <laughs> okay. So, so check out this story. Basically, um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the downturn was really because um, back in, in, you know, 2009 and in the 2008, a lot of that really happened because people were overextended. Anyone could get a loan, you know, um, you just kind of sign up. And um, one of my buddies was, was just signing up for credit cards. And this was kind of <laughs> the early days of trying to get miles and points, but yeah, travel I, hacking. I got, yeah. So I, 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 I was like, okay, what is this cool thing? Um, I've always been super interested in, and stuff like that. And um, I signed up for a credit card. I had some decent credit at the time or I was building credit. And um, I, I ended up getting this offer that was just super weird. It basically was something like a balance transfer for up to $35,000. And the rate was something like 1%. And, and you always read the fine print and you're like, okay, 1% for a year. This was 1% for life. What? And I was like, what? And I, I showed it to my buddy. He's like, dude, I, I got one. I did something like this. And it actually had a check in there. And so you write the check and you can write it to yourself. And I was like, let me just see what's up with this. And I did it. And cash was in there. And it was at 1%. You had to pay it on time. You had to set up auto payments or it'll jack up to whatever, 14% or whatever it was. But I basically had like thirty-five thousand of extra cash at one wow. percent. So I've never I, heard of, um, of said, no limit on that introductory APR oh, period was, for a credit was, card. That's how wild times were back in the days. <laughs> I I think they were they were hoping I just missed a payment or something like that. But right. um uh I I I didn't add anything else to the credit card, I just did the auto pay. And so I, I got thirty five thousand, I added a little bit to it and I wanted to do some more shopping. I still was like had this thesis about Austin. Um not not to where Austin is right now or um <laughs> but I always felt like, you know, it's got strong um student population, it's um it's a cool hip city. It wasn't super expensive. It could cash flow. And so I started looking for properties. Um, I ended up finding this four unit property. And then that's how things started kind of getting a little bit better in terms of getting deeper. And I found this four unit property and um, it was like completely underpriced. And um, it was, you know, a few hundred thousand um, kind of did the math on that. This cash flowed really well. I didn't know even the term cap rate um, at all. But I think like looking at it, looking back, I think the math, I think it was like a nine cap or something like that in Austin. That's great. And I ended up, um, uh, I ended up making an offer and purchasing that property. Um, I was remote. Um, it, you know, I, I can get into some details about the four stores behind it, but it ended <laughs> up being like a net positive out of the whole thing. I moved really quickly, purchased that property. Um, ended up going through a few different managers but got some got some tenants in place and i still own that property today um it, you know the equity has quadrupled i think or so and i look back and it basically was like equivalent to zero down um type of type of investment with that thirty five thousand that you got through the credit card at, at the one yeah, percent yeah, <laughs> for they, life yeah. interest rate yeah, i love exactly. it exactly i love it yeah, no, I, I love hearing those sorts of stories where people got creative with their down payments. Um, and in fact, on our on our blog, some of the best performing articles that we have are about you know how to get creative with down payments for rental properties and and investment properties in general. So uh, I always love that stuff. You, you mentioned that that property did come with a few horror stories. I, I'd love to hear you know a few you know just brief examples of how things went wrong for you, horror stories, you know, painful lessons that you've learned because I have found, you know, both personally and from listening to other investors that it's the things that go wrong that teach you the best lessons in life, not the things that go right. So, uh, you know, I always like to hear people's, you know, <laughs> horror stories about uh, what went wrong and, and what they learned from that and what other investors can learn hopefully the easy way by listening to, to your stories about that. 
Yeah. So um, I grew up in a cheap to frugal type of environment. And, um, and you know, bless my parents, they, they worked their butts off um, to, to help support the family and, and with very little, you know, support in, of their own. Um, and they did what they had to do. But, you know, some of those values, they, they were passed on to me. And um, I have them today. But I will say, when I think about that property, and maybe even some of the other properties that I invested in, um, I was more cheap than I was frugal. And so the way I kind of think about cheap is, um, uh, what's the analogy that people use? Penny wise, pound foolish. Um, I I was that in in certain circumstances. And I think I just wanted this like fun story that I didn't actually invest very much. I almost got like a free property, you know, out of, out of nowhere. And, um, I carried that on. So, you know, I said the property was underpriced. It was underpriced for a reason. Okay. Mm. It wasn't just, you know, I got lucky and, and stuff. Um, I think it was a mix of luck because I, I was able to find this really great property, but it was also underpriced for a quick sell and um, there needed some rehab to be done. So I, I went around just trying to find and, and ask um, who's somebody that you can trust to do some of the rehab. I remember innovation associated with that. And I got all these numbers that were like a lot more than I wanted to spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And, um, you know, I was just like, all right, I just want somebody to do this a lot, lot cheaper. What can we do? Because I bet you can get it to sprint it up pretty fast. So um, somebody introduced me to somebody and he was kind of this fast talker, um, but he gave some examples. And I was like, oh, man, you're literally half the price. So I moved forward <laughs> with him. Um, the guy that uh, that introduced me to him he was like, "Oh, I hadn't really used him, but I just heard about him." And I heard he's like, <laughs> so "I'm like, okay, awesome. all the red flags, yeah, <laughs> all the red flags." But I'm just like, um, it's not even dollar signs; it's like negative dollar signs in my eyes. Where I'm like, "Okay, this is gonna <laughs> save me some signs. money." Yeah, totally, exactly. And um, I moved forward with him. He fixed the property. I think he like sent me a couple of pictures, and I'm just like, "Okay, I don't live in Austin." Um, I, this looks good. I was like, I need to find um, a renter. Uh, I, I, and this was, you know, it wasn't as easy to just go kick off and go find renters remotely. Um, so I asked for some recommendations about property managers. And I mentioned that over um, to this, this handyman, this uh, renovation, I call him a handyman now, but he, um, he basically said, you know what? I have experience managing a few properties. I'll be happy to manage your property as well. I'm like, oh, what's what's the rate? And he goes, oh, I don't care. Whatever you want. Just a few hundred bucks. It'll be easy. And I thought this would be awesome. I was like, this guy can fix this stuff. He can manage this stuff. And um, out of nowhere, I, you know, I got I got some rents in place. He found some tenants. And I started getting some some checks that, um, you know, sent to me directly. And, you know, about three months in, um, I didn't get any payments. And I, I called them. It's like, oh, yeah, they're having some trouble and this and that. And, um, you know, long story short on this one, he basically ended up just like going MIA, um, not, you know, ever sending me any of the money. And, um, and that's not just, just one part of it. it. I mean, that's only one part of it. Um, I had to go get managers in, in. so I found a, a proper property manager. They went in and did an assessment. And then they said, hey, you're, you've got tons of repairs that you need to do. And mm-hmm. all every single person is complaining. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh. And they're like, yeah, they, he used the cheapest materials, all sorts of stuff. So at the end of the day, I actually ended up having to spend um, more than I would have if right, I to redo all gone, the work, to redo all the work. So, um, I've learned, I am still, um, value oriented. I, I get multiple quotes. I leverage my own network. I'm a little scrappy. I'll even like fix things if I'm in, in, in the location myself, oh, good for uh, you. just cause it's kind of fun. Yeah. I mean, I, used to do more of that when I had more time before, before my child, um, uh, being born. But basically, um, I like to save as much money as I can. Um, but that was the extreme that I completely learned my lesson on. So, um, there's a balance. 
I'd say. Yeah, I have. I've totally been there myself. I have done. I've made those exact same mistakes. I, I have, you know, brought in cheap handymen to do repairs that were way out of their league, and I've done all that stuff. And it was. I've brought in bad property managers. So the whole time you were telling the story, I was like, oh man, I <laughs> I know exactly where this is going because I've been there myself. So. Yeah, word to the wise out there: uh, hire good people, you know, and you can find good value, but you you need to verify the value, right? I mean, you need to actually go and and look at the work that they've done, and you know, get uh, valid referrals from people that you trust, and and all that stuff. Uh, there, I know. No... I've, I actually own a property, um, a few units in San Francisco, and oh, do you really? Uh, through through a referral, um, it's actually my co-founder at, at Awning, um, and we'll talk a little bit about Awning, but my co-founder used him, and he's amazing. And he's like, good, well-priced, trustworthy, but it took lots and lots of time. Oh, and yeah. then honestly, I think I got lucky <laughs> that I knew somebody who had used them and then passed them on to me. Yeah, well, let's so let's switch gears here for a second and talk about awning.com. So I, I love that you guys are looking to disrupt the real estate investing industry to, to an extent here. And so tell us exactly what awning does and how, how you help real estate investors. Yeah, great. So um, myself, my friends, my colleagues, my, my family, one of the biggest challenges we've had is um, investing in real estate. I wish it was just as easy as like buying a stock or something like that, yeah. um, or even just like halfway as easy. It's it's so challenging finding the resources, finding where to buy it. Um, you know all the stuff that that I went through and what my family went through. So we wanted to find an easier way um, to kick things off. Um, what we decided to do is um, look at all the data that's out there and see how can we use data and technology to go make that process a lot easier. And um, we found out the best way to be able to do that is to get access to data. And the best way to get access to data is to be your own brokerage. And so we started off as our own brokerage in California. We've since expanded to six other states. So we're, we're in seven states right now. We essentially have evolved into a Redfin for real estate investors okay. with the expectation to transition to more of a Zillow for real estate investors. And so kind of the key difference is um, we are a brokerage right now and um, we help individuals find properties, uh, make transactions and, and essentially negotiate those properties. And then from there, we can actually help them manage the properties. So there's a few caveats in between. We use data and technology the way Redfin and Zillow does right now to help price some of those properties. But also, you know, when you think about it, going to Zillow, um, they got their Zestimate. They got some other details. And that's that's cool. I think a lot of real estate investors still use them. But the, there's a couple of, of key things that are missing from that. It's it's what's the potential expected appreciation, what's expected rent, and then also you know some of the things you're looking for, long-term rentals, really trying to understand the demographic, you know the types of renters that are going to be there, short-term rentals, what does it look like if you were to have short-term rental um, uh, occupancy, what does the income look like, the expenses associated with that. So we gathered all of that and then basically hand it over. So if there's a property that's on the market, um, you can search for that property. If it's not on the market, we can also give you a short-term rental um, kind of estimate associated with it. But basically, um, we're able to calculate cap rates, you know, potential um, returns associated with that, and give you the ability to actually sort and look for certain properties that have certain types of returns. And then based on all of that, um, you can like those properties. And then we'll, you know, we have full client service teams that end up um, helping you hold your hand to go purchase that property and do the negotiation. Um, we started off, you know, a few years ago with a bigger focus on long-term rental. But the market has shifted and people are looking for more yield. And so we've gotten more and more people um, really asking and requesting um, for more short term rental support. So we have shifted more of our focus to be on short term rental. As part of that, you know, we tried our best to go partner up with some really great short term rental property managers. We didn't have a whole lot of success. And then basically we were like, you know what? 
rather than to handing them over to someone that is going to hurt their return, why don't we do this ourselves? So we've also built property management for short-term rental um, into our offering, um, which we have in-house using, again, data and technology to help um, create a little bit more of an edge. So let me ask you this, since we, we shifted for a moment here to talk about short-term rentals, I, I've heard some analysts express some concern and, and skepticism over where sh the short-term rental market is going. The thesis basically being that there's an oversupply of short-term rentals on the market right now. Uh, you know, that the market just got flooded uh, in the wake of the pandemic. Um, and you know, one piece of evidence that they point to for that is that for the last eight months, occupancy rates for uh, short-term rentals in Airbnb have been have been steadily declining. So I'm curious to hear your your thoughts on that. Um, as someone who sounds like you're you're bullish on uh, on short-term rentals in general, yeah. So there are definitely um, higher supply than there was before. Um, and the thing that we've noticed is, you know, anything that as as just like basically too good to be true type of situations, um, which we saw a lot of. And so myself, I got a little bit lucky, my family members and a lot of other people, um, we tried out short term rental pre COVID. And, um, you know, it was like, it was decent. It was good. It was good. Suddenly COVID ended up happening. I think everybody knows the story. Everyone locked down, they wanted more space and everything just started skyrocketing. What we started to see is a bunch of people wanting to um, cash in on that and, and get involved. But s some of these people didn't really think about it as um, a pure investment type of play. They, they wanted to, you know, um, be involved in that type of property, living in it as well. And what we have a lot are, are some self-managers that um, kind of just got into the, the entire game, um, you know, more for a hobby or more for a little bit, I, I don't know, I'm not gonna use the term greedy, but just kind of, you know, looking for um, a faster buck and such. And we, it's attracted a variety of different types of folks. And um, what it has led to, um, what we've seen in the press is just a lot of people um, uh, creating some really bad guest experiences just because they didn't mm -hmm. have the full experience associated with that, mixed with some saturation in certain areas. What we started right. finding out, um, if you start to pull that apart, the, the opportunity is still amazing. It's still really big. It hasn't been institutionalized and that's a good thing. Um, because basically there's a lot of opportunity. We're not saying we're going to try to institutionalize it, but what we're saying is there's a lot of opportunity to formalize things and create better processes. And professionalize. Yeah. And professionalize. And I think that's actually the better term. Um, and, and that's, that's where we've seen our, us, uh, at awning pilot this out, work with a few different folks, identify areas that aren't, you know, completely saturated and um, professionalize um, the entire guest experience, use data and technology to price this right. If the price, if it's not turning fast enough, let's dynamically start to reduce the price um, to get people in regardless. And so, um, you know, at the end of the day, I, I think that there is still a massive amount of opportunity, um, but you're going to have to pick you know, the right areas, and then also expect um, to invest a little bit more in the guest experience, invest more in better furniture, things like that, those types of details that are going to cost more. And if somebody's going in to go make a quick buck, um, they're often going to fall into the trap that I fell into. And then it starts to create this kind of like, you know, not so great guest experience, uh, your revenue starts to go down, more people are involved, those types of things. Bad reviews. Yeah. You know, I, one of the things that I have seen in that space is that people love the idea of buying a, a second home, like a vacation home, and they think that they're going to pay for it by just renting it out on an Airbnb when they're not using it. And they have another thing coming, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean like they, they, they don't, they're not approaching like a business. Um, you know, they, they are not analyzing the cash flow accurately beforehand. 
So anyway, <laughs> I'll get off my, my high horse there about, <laughs> about that. But it, it sounds like that's what you've been seeing as well, is that a lot of people just get into it uh, without approaching it uh, with the professionalism that they really need to to consistently earn positive cash flow with it. Uh, so as, as someone who is in the real estate investing technology space, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on how you see technology changing real estate investment investments moving forward, you know, both in the short term, you know, over the next year or two and, you know, longer term, you know, through, through the end of this decade. Yeah. You know, a lot of the old school real estate investors, um, some of them became accidental. A lot of them um, pre-technology, my parents included, um, would put signs out and um, kind of estimate what felt right, you know, in terms of what those rents are. Um, now we have data and technology to go make things a lot more efficient and have longer and, and broader types of reach. And so I think I think as a whole, efficiency is, is kind of the key to everything. Um, when you think about the way you've traditionally bought a property, and this isn't for everyone that's listening today, but you know how it's been in the past is you talk to a trusted real estate agent that you know someone that is referred to you by another friend. And um, what we end up finding out is vast majority of those people, literally, and we did some research on this, it's over 95% of real estate agents do not have a focus or deep experience in working with investors. And, right. um, and because of that, they can't take it from that more of a business ROI type of mindset. Um, and so, you know, with other companies like Awning, um, being able to have that data, aggregate, aggregating it more an investor type of focus, um, we can make smarter decisions. Uh, and, and you can do that on your own, again, leveraging our site to be able to identify what's the highest cap rate type of properties that we estimate out there, or even working with, you know, a company like us or others that have more experience in the investment world. We have seen more um, technology companies, but also just the real estate industry start to shift and build more support for real estate investors. And that's something that's amazing and, and great. Um, but it's there's still a lot more opportunity um, associated with that. But I mean, back in the days when I just started investing, um, I think Redfin and Zillow was just like brand new. And I, I just thought it was the very coolest thing. And I just kind of used it um, in a way to, to get a little bit more of an edge um, against other people. Now, you know, there's a lot more opportunities that have um, uh, ways to, you know, even predict pricing, um, be able to pull aggregated rents. What does that look like? And then, you know, allow you to make smarter decisions. Um, I also think, at least in the short term rental type of world, uh, because there's so many additional factors, uh, it was always, um, you know, more challenging. You're like, you're talking about seasonality, those types of details. Again, there's a number of tools out there. Um, we leverage some of those, um, uh, both proprietary and, and working with partners to help predict what that pricing could be based on, you know, factors that could change on a daily basis. Um, but just imagine, you know, how you used to do that even just a few years ago. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if you're, yeah, if you're in a town that has like a, a big event, right? Like if, if you're in Augusta, Georgia, and you have the Masters golf tournament that you know once a year just you know spikes hey, all the, uh, you know all the all the short term rents and and nightly rates, um, you know that's something that it's it's helpful to have good data on that going back, so you know how to price your uh, your Airbnbs and so forth. Uh, you know, and one one other way that I've seen technology really change real estate investing over the last six seven years is we've really seen a lot more um, long distance investing. Um, yes. You know, like what, I mean, you were you were actually doing this a decade ahead of the curve with that. Um, you know, living in the Bay Area and investing in Austin, uh, but it's just gotten so much easier to buy properties long distance. Uh, nowadays with with virtual tours and with all the, the good data available and, and platforms like Roofstock out there. Uh, yeah, and that, so we've actually, nationwide, there's been a huge jump in the number of sight unseen uh, investment properties bought long distance by investors. Uh, so yeah, it'll just be curious. It'll be interesting to see what kind of trends like that we see over the next decade. 
Yeah, yeah, I, that's a really good point. I think 95% of our clients um, that end up purchasing properties with us do not go see the property first. We've set oh, wow. up a number of different avenues where we leverage, you know, on the ground types of teams to, to do video tours and um, do inspections and things like that. But, um, you know, the level of fidelity that we're able to offer through that is, is fantastic. But that wasn't possible back in the day. So, so much of it was like trusting a person. And even at that time, you know, how much trust do you want to put uh, into one person if, if it could have some big, you know, risk associated with it? Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, Dianis, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we've put a link uh, to Awning in the comments. Uh, how, how else can people reach you and, and, you know, connect with you about what you guys are doing over at, uh, at Awning? Yeah, um, uh, awning, it's awning.com. So feel free to, to reach out directly there. We even have a phone number. Um, uh, you can kind of surf around. We have got a bunch of really great free tools that do some pricing. Go check that out. Um, you don't even have to fully register to get access to that. But um, yeah, there's a number of, of links within there where you can set up a phone call and speak to a live person um, to help support things. Imagine that, <laughs> being able to speak with a live human being in, in today's world. I love it. Well, Dana, <laughs> thank you again. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to staying in touch with you. Uh, audience members, stay in touch with us. Let us know what you want to hear about. And we will catch you guys on the flip side. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Brian.